I'm Peg Breen. I'm president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. It's a wonderful day for a stroll, and we're glad you could join us. I'm sure most of us think we're familiar with Rockefeller Center, but we have some secrets to show you today, and no better person to do that than our manager of special projects, Glenn Umberger. He'll be starting in a second, but first, our colleague Colleen Hemeyer is going to tell you how to submit your questions if you have them during the program and we'll do a Q&A after. Colleen. Right, so if you have questions, can you just use the Q&A function that is at the bottom of my screen in the toolbar just to the right of the participants. And um, I believe everyone is muted, but please don't unmute yourself during this. Thank you. Okay. Glenn, take it away. Thank you, Peg. If you have spent any time in New York City, most likely you've been to Rockefeller Center. This relatively small slice of Midtown Manhattan typically draws thousands of visitors every day, especially during the holiday season. But on a recent warm late summer morning, I had a much different experience. Gone are the crowds of tourists, shoppers, and office workers. The famed ice rink here in its summer arrangement is quiet and all around are reminders to maintain a safe social distance and wear your mask. Thank you, Prometheus. Even so, Rockefeller Center is an amazing place for art, architecture, and the lush landscape gardens and fountains in the very heart of the city. So for our time together this afternoon, I would like to share with you my top 10 hidden secrets of Rockefeller Center. Secret number one, John Davison Rockefeller Jr. I think it's only appropriate that we should begin with the namesake of Rockefeller Center. Known as Jr. to distinguish him from his father, John D. Rockefeller Sr., the founder of Standard Oil Company, Jr. was the only son and youngest of five children of John D. and Laura Rockefeller. He studied at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, where he was known by his roommates as Johnny Rock, and served as junior class president, was a member of the Alpha Delta Phi fraternity, and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Following his graduation from Brown in 1897, Junior returned to New York City, where he went to work for Standard Oil Company, then located at number 26 Broadway in Lower Manhattan. That building is seen here on the right in this historic photograph, looking northeasterly across Bowling Green. On Wednesday, October 9th, 1901, Junior married the former Abigail Green Aldridge, and the couple had six children, seen here in this wonderful family portrait. But rather than pursuing a career in business like his father, Junior was more interested in philanthropic and civic activities, particularly those causes that advanced human welfare and international interfaith and interracial concepts. Junior was actually a historic preservationist. And one of the In 1926, Junior and his family toured the sleepy village of Williamsburg, accompanied by the Reverend Dr. William Archer Rutherford Goodwin, then the rector of Bruton Parish Church. Dr. Goodwin espoused the potential of restoring the town to its vibrant colonial era past, which Goodwin declared was an opportunity to create a shrine that would bear witness to the faith and the devotion and the sacrifice of the American national builders. In this photograph from two years later, we see Rockefeller with Goodwin discussing the progress of the restoration of Virginia's colonial capital. It has been estimated that over his lifetime, Junior gave away over $537 million to various causes, including personally financing this little 22-acre New York City real estate development project. Secret number two, Rockefeller Center was once a sparsely populated area of the island of Manhattan. It's easy to forget that Rockefeller Center wasn't always there. 
and we may never and we may even be tempted to think that nothing was really there before these landmark buildings existed. In fact, there really wasn't much of anything there in 1859. This map from that year shows the blocks between 47th and 52nd streets and 4th and 6th avenues. The most prominent architectural feature is St. Patrick's Cathedral, the large pink rectangle in the center right of the map, then in the early stages of its construction. The blocks that would later become Rockefeller Center were at this point solely occupied by two rows of brick houses along 6th Avenue, those little pink boxes on the far left, and a few lonely timber-framed buildings, the yellow boxes scattered around. But by 1890, this part of Midtown Manhattan was entirely unrecognizable. Among the more than 200 buildings that now occupied the modestly sized lots were many row houses, including these at numbers 59 to 63 West 48th Street. These at numbers 12 to 16 West 48th Street down the block, and these two, numbers 35 and 37 West 50th Street, two blocks to the north. Another notable architectural feature was the 6th Avenue elevated train line flanking the area's western boundary. The 6th Avenue L originally ran between Rector Street downtown and 58th Street at Central Park when it opened in June 1878. The train line included a station at West 50th Street, as seen in this photograph from the 1930s, shortly before the L was demolished. In addition to the station suspended above the sidewalk, you may even recognize a few familiar landmarks in the background. Personally, I like the classic cars parked curbside. Secret number three, the little old brick building. If you happen to be walking down 6th Avenue, you may no notice a little old brick building on the northwest corner at 49th Street. You may have even stopped inside Magnolia Bakery at number 1246 6th Avenue for a classic cupcake. But as an architectural historian, when I encountered odd buildings like this one in the modern urban fabric of our city, I often wondered, what's its story? And in fact, there is quite an interesting story behind this little old brick building. In the mid-1850s, this was one of the houses that occupied the block between West 49th and 50th Streets on the east side of 6th Avenue. Here is a detail of the 1859 map I showed you earlier. But the interesting part of the story begins after the house was converted from residential into commercial usage. In 1892, three enterprising Irishmen, Patrick Daly, Daniel Hurley, and his brother Connie, leased this four-story building and opened a saloon, appropriately named Hurley Brothers and Daly, complete with a 54-foot-long mahogany bar. Business was good. In fact, very good. That is, until prohibition was made law of the land on Saturday, January 17th, 1920. As a result, Hurley's did what an estimated 100,000 other New York City drinking establishments would do. They became a speakeasy. But prohibition was not the only problem for Hurley's in the 1920s. It was about this time that John D. Rockefeller Jr. arrived on the scene, buying out a staggering amount of real estate and quite literally at Hurley's back door for the future Rockefeller Center development. In September 1931, as this photograph shows, demolition was well underway behind a now very lonely little old brick building. Now, the building itself was initially sold to Rockefeller, but Hurley's as a tenant still held a long-term lease, which put them in a strong negotiating position for a potential lease buyout from Mr. Rockefeller. They asked for $250 million. Long story short, Rockefeller didn't pay, and the little old brick building was spared with its bar room intact. Decades later, the following description appeared in New York Magazine. Hurley's is a four-story David thumbing his nose at the Goliath that is Rockefeller Center. Hurley's lived on to see another day, and a day it had. Given its close proximity to Rockefeller Center later in the 20th century, 
Early's became a very popular watering hole for celebrities, office workers, and tourists alike. But of course, we all know that the only constant in New York City is change, and change came for Hurley's in 1979 after its lease finally expired and Hurley's moved out. Nevertheless, the little old brick building still stands today at the corner of West 49th Street and 6th Avenue as a 19th century relic in a 21st century city. Secret number four, the rink at Rockefeller Center. Perhaps the most famous ice skating rink in the world, or at least in New York City, is here at Rockefeller Center. Located in the iconic Sunken Plaza, home to Prometheus and his fountain, the rink at Rockefeller Center was not part of the original plan. The quarter acre plaza was designed to be accessed from Fifth Avenue via the promenade at the Channel Gardens and down a granite stairway. From there, one could enter 30 Rockefeller Center from below street level into what was planned to be a grand underground shopping concourse surrounding the sunken plaza. After Prometheus was installed in May 1934, the retail space was finished and ready for occupancy the following year. But the shoppers never came, and it was soon deemed to be an unprofitable business venture. The plaza, envisioned to be a gateway into a vast urban subterranean emporium, was reimagined as something rather unique, even for New York City. In early December 1936, the New York Times reported that construction of a new skating pond had be begun on the lower plaza of Rockefeller Center, adjacent to the Prometheus Fountain. According to the Times, the pond will occupy virtually all of the lower plaza area. From seats encircling the rink, spectators will be able to watch skaters under glaring floodlights. In addition, there will be a heated house for changing skates and shoes. It was scheduled to open to the public a few weeks later at 10 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. Since that first Christmas morning back in 1936, the rink at Rockefeller Center has welcomed millions of winter visitors to skate beneath the soaring skyscrapers in the glow of the glaring floodlights, all under the ever watchful eye of Prometheus. Secret number five, there used to be a church across the street. While Fifth Avenue's most famous church may be St. Patrick's Cathedral, there used to be another majestic house of worship just across the avenue. Today, park, part of Rockefeller Center, the southwest corner of West 48th Street and Fifth Avenue was once home to the Collegiate Reform Protestant Dutch Church of St. Nicholas, known then also as New York's Dutch Cathedral. In 1869, the church commissioned architect William Wheeler Smith to design a new building to replace their outdated one. Completed in 1872, this building was an exuberant Gothic revival pile marked by a purposely designed, disproportionately tall spire that soared 265 feet above the sidewalk, and which the New York Times reported, many declare it to be the most beautiful in this country. Noted architectural critic Montgomery Schuyler disagreed, saying it was simply Gothic gone warring mad. The Gothic revival style was also employed by James Renwick Jr. across the street at St. Patrick's Cathedral which was being built concurrently with St. Nicholas. While St. Patrick's gleamed in white Georgia marble, St. Nicholas stood across the avenue in stark contrast garbed in New Jersey brownstone. Upon its completion, the real estate record and builder's guide called St. Nicholas an outs outstanding example of the Gothic revival style, and in doing so, ignored St. Patrick's entirely. The record and guide opined among the many wretched platitudes with which downright ignorance has defaced this city under the pretended name of Gothic architecture, it is so refreshing to meet with a building which, as is in this case, exhibits a thorough knowledge, motive, and earnest thought into the designer that we should be very sorry to do it injustice. The record and guide went on to say, with all its peculiarities, it is so immeasurably superior to the generality of churches hitherto erected in New York, 
that the author of it may be fairly ranked among the very few architects in our midst to whom we can look for anything like progress in art. Now, of course, St. Nicholas was erected at a time when the neighborhood was home to some of the wealthiest New Yorkers. And among, and among its parishioners was a young Theodore Roosevelt, who along with his family occupied pew number 39 weekly for Sunday services. But as the neighborhood changed over the years and wealthy congregants moved farther uptown, the Collegiate Church of St. Nicholas was facing the same crisis as other established churches of the time. By early 1946, the New York Times reported that the church was considering selling its property to a developer for the expansion of Rockefeller Center. The church's minister, the Reverend Dr. Joseph Sitsu, was adamantly against the sale of the building, saying that to do so would put a dollar sign before the cross. The congregation remained severely divided on the issue. Three years later in 1949, after Sitsu resigned over the conflict, along with a mass exodus of members who supported him, the property was sold. The Majestic Church was replaced by the Sinclair Oil Building, today simply known as 600 Fifth Avenue, which opened in 1952. One contemporary critic called it rather bland, yet relatively inoffensive. Ironically, it was designated a New York, landmark, New York City landmark in 1985. Secret number six, Rockefeller Center is an outdoor art museum. You may have never thought it before, but Rockefeller Center is an outdoor museum with a fine collection of world-class art, and much of it is hidden in plain sight. Most visitors, however, are captivated by Raymond Hood's RCA building, the Soren Art Deco skyscraper known today simply as 30 Rock. But if you take a moment to look closely, you may notice three rather colorful sculptural panels over the front doors. These are the creative work of one of America's leading architectural sculptures of his day, Lee Laurie. Laurie was commissioned for several pieces at Rockefeller Center, including this one, the iconic Wisdom, which is found over the central portal of 30 Rock. Here, the allegorical figure of Wisdom has a commanding presence surrounded by the clouds and accompanied by the words of the prophet Isaiah, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Wisdom, the creative power of the universe, is flanked by sound, the allegory for radio and telephone, and light, representing motion pictures and television. Of course, one would expect to find such themes on the headquarters of the Radio Corporation of America. Laurie was also responsible for arguably Rockefeller Center's most iconic work of art, Atlas, the colossal 45-foot tall bronze of the mythological Titan who was condemned to hold up the universe on his shoulders for all eternity. The secret is the north-south axis of the sphere points to the North Star's position relative to New York City. On my recent visit to Rockefeller Center's international building, I noticed that even Titan wears a mask from protect, for protection from COVID-19. Secret number seven, art, part two. The art at Rockefeller Center, as we have just seen, is colorful. And the next examples I would like to show you are quite colorful indeed. Displayed on the 50th Street elevation of Radio City Music Hall are three metal and enamel rondels. And if you've never taken the time to stop and look at them, you must make it a point to do so the next time you're in the neighborhood. These are the work of Hildreth Meyer, one of the most prolific and most famous American muralists of the Art Deco period. She believed a good mural should do something that should be something that cannot be taken away without hurting the design of the building. Executed by Oscar Bach in 1932 to Meyer's sketches, these three 18-foot diameter pieces were installed on an otherwise blank spot 60 feet above the sidewalk, and they represent various themes related to what happens inside the building. Here we have dance, 
drama, and song. One art critic at the time noted that they were finished in brilliantly colored enamel, which are not only splendid in themselves, but indicate a new possibility in the use of color on building exteriors. But along with these three for Radio City Music Hall, Mier created a fourth piece for the Rockefeller Center development. The RKO Roxy Theater, later known as the Center Theater, was first a movie palace and then a venue for, a large, for large stage theatrical productions. With a seating capacity of 3,500, it was the smaller though equally luxurious fraternal twin to the more musical Radio City nearby. For the Roxy, Mier designed the stunning radio and television encompassing the earth, seen here in her sketch from 1932. But unfortunately, neither the RKO Roxy nor the center was a financial success, and the theater was demolished along with Mier's medallion in 1954 to make room for a modern air-conditioned 19-story office building, today home to Simon & Schuster. But here's the secret. As part of a 1980s renovation of Rockefeller Center's West Subway Concourse, local artist Gary Sussman recreated Mier's radio and television encompassing the earth using her 1932 watercolor sketch as a guide. And here it is today. In a slightly smaller size, on display, on display not far from the original, albeit in a much less prominent location. I will leave its precise spot a secret for you to discover on your own. Secret number eight, the British Empire. You may recognize this next building on the southwest corner of 50th Street at Fifth Avenue. It's actually one of my favorite Rockefeller Center buildings. The British Empire Building at 625th Avenue was completed in 1934 as a six-story retail building. One notable architectural feature is its front door, or more precisely, the three panels above the door by the German-born sculptor Karl Genuin, which feature nine gold-leaf allegorical figures, including cotton, wheat, and sugar depicting the global reach of the empire on which the sun never sets. Genuine also created the wonderful and colorful cartouche above the door, emblazoned with the motto of the British monarch in Latin. I'll award bonus points later for the proper English translation. Even the building's side entrances are fantastic, with more colorful decorations by our friend Lee Laurie, who depicts the mythological figure of Mercury with his caduceus, seen here on the building's southern elevation. But the secret here is something you may have never noticed before. In the parapet at the sixth floor, overlooking Fifth Avenue, are four boss reliefs by René Paul Chamberlain, who incidentally was also the sculptor of Atlas. These, of course, are the four coats of arms of the United Kingdom, seen here from left to right, Wales, England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. I would suggest these are more works of art to examine the next time you visit Saks Fifth Avenue. Secret number nine, the hidden details. One of the things that makes Rockefeller, so, Rockefeller Center so special, and you may have already begun to notice this, are all the little details that can be found throughout the center, which is remarkable given the fact that there were several architects, artisans, and designers who had to work together in unison to create this city within a city. And hidden in plain sight are some real treasures, like this little crab hiding out in the Channel Gardens fountain. But some of Rockefeller's hidden treasures are not only art, they have a useful function, like these. Art Deco style tree guards. These Art Deco style address markers and the wonderful Art Deco style clocks perched above each of the building entrances around the complex. The font used for the signage is also a fantastic design element. 
But perhaps the really big secret here is that Rockefeller Center has a lot of little things to discover if only you take the time to look for them. And finally, secret number 10. The Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center became a tradition by accident. Of course, no top 10 list of Rockefeller Center would be complete without the famous Christmas tree. So here's the story in a nutshell. In 1931, workers pooled their little spare cash they had on Christmas Eve to decorate a 20-foot balsam fir with strings of cranberries, garlands of paper, and even a few tin cans. Modest as it was, it was a bright spot in an otherwise gloomy holiday season during the Great Depression. But the tree lighting ceremony we know and love today didn't start until 1933, when that year's tree, a 40-foot tall balsam fir, was illuminated with a rather impressive 700 electric light bulbs. By comparison, in 2019, the 12-ton, 77-foot tall Norway spruce, which was first planted in a yard in Florida, New York in 1959, after serving as the owner's personal Christmas tree that year, was dressed in 50,000 rainbow-hued LED bulbs and topped by a 900-pound glittering Swarovski crystal-studded star. I'm sure it's safe to say that those construction workers from 1931 would be impressed to see a tradition they started on a whim being carried on well into the 21st century. Of course, the Christmas tree for 2020 still remains a secret. So there you have it, my top 10 hidden secrets of Rockefeller Center. I hope you enjoyed our brief virtual tour this afternoon, and I hope that this has inspired you to venture out for a leisurely stroll and explore the art and architecture of Rockefeller Center for yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. You know, I've wandered around there and thought I spotted a lot, but you showed me a lot more. <laughs> Thank you. We have questions for Glenn. Yes, we have two so far. Um, the first one is from Martha, and she asks, uh, under what circumstances was Rockefeller able to buy up so much real estate? Um, Rockefeller, besides having the financial backing of his personal fortune, um, employed a large number of real estate agents um, to go and buy out the 200 or so properties that were required for Rockefeller Center. Because today we probably would have been picketing to save the brownstones. Yes. yes. Um, the next question is from Dean. And he asks, is the art on the face of the AP building by Noguchi? Noguchi? Sorry if I butchered that. <laughs> um, yes. yes. That's, that's right. Okay, great. Next and, I, and you probably noticed that I included a, a detail of that um, sculpture in my, one of my slides. Uh, next question is from Tom. And he, uh, or it's really more of a statement, uh, Columbia University owned the land and leased it to Rockefeller. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, next question is from Bill. What do we know about the building on the corner of 50th and 6th? Um, 50th and 6th. Can you describe it a little? Yeah. yeah which, which, which building are you talking about? Uh, other side of Magnolia. Oh, in the other corner. Yes, the other corner. So that today is, um, I believe, Warby Parker's in there. Um, that was another holdout building. Um, the, the owner um, actually flatly refused to sell to Rockefeller. So, um, he was the other holdout along with um, where Hurley's was. Um, so that building survives um, thanks to the building owner not selling. Um, same story, same basic story as Hurley's. Started as a small four story residential um, townhouse and then went commercial. 
Great. Uh, the next question is from Dean. Uh, were the different heights of the buildings regulated by law at that time? Complex um, was uh, under the um, restraints of the um, 1916 um, zone law. Um, part of what made the complex unique um, is the architects built buildings of different sizes, so there was no uniform height um, to give more visual interest um, and also to make 30 Rock uh, more prominent by being the, the tallest structure in the complex. That was the centerpiece. Um, Tom would like to know if you have any more information about the center theater. I do, Tom. Um, if you send me an email, I'd be happy to share with you with what, you, what I have. Um, there's a lot of information about that building. Um, I have one journal article from 1932 um, that did a photo display of both the center, which was originally the RKO, Roxy, comparing with um, Radio City Music Hall. And um, seeing those two images side by side, they're, they're fantastic. Um, but I, I'd be happy to send that out to people if they're interested. Great. Um, next is from Holly. Why did the Hurleys not, I'm assuming that means, negotiate their lease? Um, Hurleys had originally a long-term lease. Um, and when the owners of the building originally sold um, to Rockefeller, um, they Hurley's was going to exercise the terms of their lease. So they weren't going anyway. Um, they were hoping that they would get Rockefeller to buy them out, um, make some money on the deal. Um, Rockefeller was agreeable to the idea and asked them, well, how much money do you want? And they said $250 million, um, which incidentally was the exact amount of what it cost Rockefeller to build the entire Rockefeller Center in the first place. Um, but of course, Rockefeller said no. So um, Hurley still had a lease, and um, the building the sale did not go forward, and they were able to stay. I hope that answered your question. Um, a few more questions here. Okay. Um, when did NBC Johnny Carson move in? Um, I don't know the I don't know this this year certain. I'd have to look that up. Glenn, I'm going to jump in and make a suggestion. Your audio is so garbled. Can you maybe go to Peg's computer and answer more questions there and we'll create a little distraction while you run over there? Sure. Okay. Yes, I, I just sent out a message. Apologize. I wasn't sure what to, what to do about it. So it only started yeah. after questions. Okay. Yeah, there's always an element of like 1950s live television with these Zoom things. So, so uh, Glenn is running down the hall. I will move <laughs> and we'll take over from here. Here we are. Okay. And we're back live. Okay, great. So the next question here is uh, concerning the murals in the lobby of 30 Rock, what was the concept behind the whole unified? set of murals? Um, that is um, almost a master's thesis in its own right. Um, I think I'm going to table that question for another walking tour. So stay tuned. Because that's a rather interesting story. Um, Joanne would be interested in knowing more about the St. Nicholas Church. Do you have okay. any information you can provide or we can email to her? Yes, um, I can get her information as well on that. Okay, great. Uh, Joanne, if you want to just send me um, your personal email, you can send it directly to me um, in the chat. That would be great. 
Uh, next uh, is from Howard. Why is the street adjacent to NBC closed for a day each year? Um, you've stumped me on that one. <laughs> we'll have to look into that for you. Dean has a big secret to share. The animals were participating in the Radio City Christmas show. The camel, the pony, actually the sheep. They exercise every morning outside the AP building around 7.30. That is, that is accurate. I've seen it happen. Yes, and I had a close encounter with a camel about five years ago. That's, <laughs> okay. a, story. That's a story for another day. <laughs> Alyssa, do you have any... Uh, anecdotes from your time with the Rockettes? <laughs> well, the, pon uh, the camel and the sheep, there isn't a pony in the show, but they do live at the music hall during the Christmas season. They have their handlers um, who are actually in the show. They get dressed up for the nativity scene. Um, and, and Dean is right. They do go outside um, the stage door every morning <laughs> and they are, um, you know, given their exercises and their walks and things like that. It's, uh, it's quite the scene. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then I think in Radio City Music Hall, I think my favorite part is uh, the Roxy Suite where, you know, it was Rockefeller's uh, apartment at one point. So lots of cool things in, in, Rock, uh, in Rock Center. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes. Let's see. Uh, can you speak about the lost Diego R Rivera fresco in the lobby of the RCA building? So that goes back to the mural lobby. I mean, the, the uh, lobby murals for um, another tour. Um, that's a interesting long story that I would love to share with you, but we're gonna do that on another, another tour. Okay, great. And that's all we have. Okay. Well, from me to you, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I always enjoy these things. I hope you did too. Um, I hope you learned something new. Um, if you did, please let us know because I always like to leave people with something new that they didn't know before. Um, and um, Colleen, do you have anything to add before we close? I do not. Thank you everybody for coming and uh, dealing with our little tech issues. Thank you very much, everybody. And I uh, hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye.